I want to look at this text today. It's interesting to me, this post-Easter text. Uh, often we probably glance over. Jesus' efforts to convince the disciples that he is alive and embodied on Easter evening show us how important it is that the resurrection is a bodily event. One question I am always asked is, what will it be like in heaven? Well, as far as our bodies are concerned, Jesus gives us some clues. You, you might wonder why a preacher would want to talk about the human body today. You might think I'm being a little uh, forward or, or nosy. I get it. No one likes to be lectured about highly personalized things like the status of their bodies. That reminds me of the story of the elderly gentleman who Stop, was stopped by the police around 2 a.m. one morning and is asked where he is going at this time of the night. The man replies, I'm on my way to a lecture about alcohol abuse and the effects it has on the human body, as well as smoking and staying out late. The officer then asks, really? Who is giving that lecture at this time of night? The man replies, that would be my wife. To say the least, most of us are self-conscious about our bodies. Some cope by making light of it. In a certain biology class, the teacher was go going over the makeup of the human body. She said to the class, did you know that the human body is approximately 80% water? A boy in the front row immediately blurted out, thank you for clarifying this, Ms. Jones. It means I'm not overweight. I'm just well hydrated. <laughs> okay. What, what's the point of our bodies? You ever think about that? You know, they connect us to each other, to the world, and yes, to God. This past year has made the scene of our gospel lesson for today. A bunch of uh, adult friends gathered in the same room for a meal, a rare occurrence, a fantasy. What was a simple, wholly unappreciated fact of life beforehand, putting our bodies in a room together, vanished in an instant. It was only a little over a year ago when we said we'd make our worship services online only for a few weeks during the lockdown. Sure, that we would be back in church by Easter. Since then, it's safe to say that all of us have come to a greater recognition of what a wonderful thing it is to gather with others, to be close, to touch one another, be seen by each other. The virtual simulcast just ain't it. In Luke's telling of Easter evening, the disciples are gathered, huddled really, in a room as they hide from authorities responsible for Jesus' execution just a few days prior. Two of their friends one named Cleopas, ran in a few minutes before to announce that they had seen Jesus, that he had walked with them to Emmaus and had explained the scriptures to them, that they had recognized him only when he broke the bread in their presence. In the midst of the conversation, suddenly Jesus is there. He's saying, peace be with you. But the disciples are terrified and afraid. They thought they were seeing a ghost, a spirit. They didn't see how Jesus could be standing in front of them in a body. His body had been killed. He was dead. The tomb was empty. But what could that really mean? A biblical scholar uh, called N.T. Wright and others have, have argued at length the resurrection of a single individual in the midst of history was an unprecedented notion in Second Temple Judaism. They never had any concept of it. It's no wonder that the disciples were, were startled with doubts rising in their hearts of what they were seeing and hearing. Now, many believe that there would come a resurrection at the end of time of all the righteous, God's vindication of their faithfulness. But this was different. So Jesus goes to work to convince his disciples that he is not a ghost, but that he is standing before them fully human, body and all. He is not an apparition, but the real thing. He presents his hands and his feet to them, holding them out to show where the nails had been, offering that they can even touch. 
can reach out for confirmation that yes, indeed, Jesus is standing there alive in the flesh. Before Christians could go around convincing others that Jesus had been resurrected in the flesh, Jesus had first to convince his own disciples that he was not a ghost. Aside from his abstinence from the word boo, the best arguments he had are his hands and feet, marred still by the nails and also made whole again. Look at my hands and my feet, he says. It's, it's really me. Touch me and see, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. Showing them his hands and feet is adequate to turn the shock into happiness, but it doesn't resolve all of their questions. When that is not enough to persuade them, he asks if there's anything edible around and they scrounge up some leftover fish for Jesus to eat. I almost see some humor in this. What, what could be more human than eating, right, Bethany? And <laughs> our times at the table together. What, what could be a more embodied thing to do than to eat something? Luke does not record for us the disciples' responses, but it's easy to imagine their fearful and perplexed murmuring simmering into awe and wonder of what's taking place right before them. They may not understand the how of the resurrection, but they had no counter argument regarding the what. Jesus Christ is alive again in the flesh, eating leftover fish. He had been dead, inarguably dead, as his lint form was removed from the cross. But now he was alive, in fact, looking more alive than anyone else they had ever seen. Some of you may have seen Disney's new film, Soul. You'll know that bodiless spirits can try to eat human food, but that it doesn't work out quite well. The food falls straight through, entirely intact. But Jesus, not being a ghost, eats the whole piece of fish. Finally, the disciples believe their eyes. I'm reminded that the church has always struggled with this notion of a resurrected body. Early on, there were some Christians called do docetists who argued that Jesus never took human form, that he was always just a spirit. They contended that, that to take upon him human flesh would contaminate him with sin and evil. So he was never really physically present, just an apparition. They argued that Jesus's humanity was on the order of seeming rather than being, that God did not really suffer on the cross. Parts of the New Testament respond against such a thought. First John, whom we looked at last week, said Jesus was the one whom we've heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon and touched, handled, the Greek word suggests, with our hands. The early Christians, really most Christians, contended that denying that Jesus was really, truly, fully human amounted to a rejection of the faith. Now, I know modern folks like us think that talk like this is strange and unrelatable, right? Right? Lately, the trends in the way that folks think about their bodies seem to be going in two directions. On the one hand, people claim at least to love their bodies. I know some folks are extremely conscious of what they are and are not willing to put in their bodies. They love exercising and trying through exercise and nutrition to form their bodies to be the way they want their bodies to perform and appear. They might hope that the right wellness and lifestyle choices will all but offer the ability to cheat death, that they might get out of life alive. I don't want to disparage this trend. We should take care of ourselves, but I don't think we need to obsess. Now, there are other people who love their bodies so much that they refuse to conform to societal pressure, that they should make their bodies appear any certain way. This body positive movement tells people to embrace the body they are. 
there's much Christians can find to like about the idea of loving bodies, their bodies, knowing that our bodies are good gifts from a good creator. And as Paul says, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, the opposite trend, this, the other trend that's going on these days seems to treat the bodies as an inconvenience, an un uncomfortable vestige of an evolutionary process that couldn't find any other options. These folks might refer to their bodies as meat sacks or bags of chemicals. I heard that on a, a show just the other day. Somebody mentioned that. Dreaming of a day when we might be able to defeat its limitations, negating the effects of aging. For folks like this, the distancing of the pandemic foresees a future only seldom, if at all, requiring interaction in bodily ways, where everything can be handled virtually. Oh, God help us. In the most extreme forms, these futurist or transhumanists, as in transcending what is human, hope that a day may come when we can upload our consciousness to computers shuffling off this mortal coil, not in death, but in an upload of self. In this singularity, as they sometimes call it, these virtual human beings, if they can really be called human, would be able to live essentially forever so long as nothing happened to their servers. Good luck with that. <laughs> I recall a recent Amazon Prime video series entitled Upload, of all things about a man who is able to choose his own afterlife after his untimely death by having his consciousness uploaded into a virtual world. Uh, it doesn't go that well. <laughs> Though uploading consciousness to the cloud is a cruel parody of going to heaven, this repudiation of death is something that Christians can identify with. We are under no obligation to embrace death as a friend, nor even to accept the decay and disease we experience beforehand as anything other than an unnatural intrusion into God's plan for humanity. The, the key difference comes in where we look for the, the redemption from death's clutches. While the futurists are looking ahead at more advanced computers, Christians look back to a rural Jewish rabbi. God's son, who trampled death by death. Where the futurists want to be saved from their bodies, we look to a day when we can be saved into our resurrected bodies, bodies that can, like Jesus's, be recognized, touch and be touched, can eat food with friends, can continue to share real, albeit transformed, space. I know that's tough stuff to swallow and, and to understand, but the truth of it is glorious. What Jesus promises does not end at learning to love our mortal flesh a little better. It ends at transfigured spiritual flesh. When we too are resurrected, our given bodies recognizably our own and yet no longer feeling the effects of sin and death. Wow. All those things we love about our bodies, according to our text today, are taken up into spiritual bodies, the spiritual bodies we will receive. God's plan for the universe will not be complete until we have received these spiritual bodies. Christian hope is about more than going to heaven, about being a bodiless soul. Being a bodiless soul in heaven is not God's best for us. Christian hope is for an embodied future, according to Luke. The caress of the beloved, the meal with friends, these are a part of God's future for us. The joy of fellowship with one another. There is nothing like this fellowship, is there? Jesus demonstrates it transcends space and time and ext extends beyond even death. It is real and lasting, and it reminds me of that song, you know, we all were, we grew up in church with that we used to sing at a close of the worship service. Remember that? Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. It indeed is the fellowship of faith around the table 
bodily embracing the joy of new life because of Christ. Bethany family, this is what we celebrate together. This is what we have in Christ, the joy of fellowship and the hope of one day around an extended table, we will sit and talk. Yes, we will laugh and slap backs together and we will eat together to the glory of God. Fellowship, resurrected body. May that always be God's plan for us. Amen.